Koto Katoa, um, and thank you for that introduction, Amy. I stand here in some trepidation, hoping that you've got your boxes of rotten tomatoes um, safely under your seat, because it's clear that uh, alcohol marketing is a really sensitive topic. Uh, it's not one that we overlook in schools of marketing. I would hope that any of my students who became a brand manager for an alcohol company would do so in the sure knowledge of what it was they were marketing, and without some pretty serious twinges of conscience. So uh, when Jenny asked me to, to talk today, um, I said to her, actually, I don't really know anything about alcohol marketing. In fact, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure I know an awful lot about marketing, apart from the fact that it's largely common sense. I, I spent most of my academic career working in tobacco control, and I think there are lots of parallels, and Amy's already alluded to those, between tobacco and alcohol marketing. Now, whenever I say that, people say, look, you know, tobacco is a fundamentally different product to alcohol. And of course it is. And when I'm talking about parallels, I'm not talking about similarities between the products. I'm talking about the parallels between the industries, the sorts of questions that Rebecca, I think, was, was drawing to our attention in her question. So I'd like to cover three general areas. First of all, I'd like to look at the, the broader industry. So what do we know about corporate marketing and social responsibility? Because I think that they're very important areas to look at. We know a lot about brand marketing because tobacco brands are so ubiquitous. They're such a pervasive part of our everyday environment. But often I think we know very little about what the industries that promote those brands are actually doing. And here I think we have much to learn from our knowledge of the tobacco industry. Then I want to cover marketing fundamentals, which I think we can distill down to three fairly simple principles. Uh, I'm just going to talk about those principles because there are other people with much more detailed expertise in alcohol marketing than I have who will be talking to you about sports integration and sponsorship and social media. So I'm just sticking to these three core principles, which I'll outline later. And then finally, and I hope this doesn't sound hopelessly defensive, um, but I, I want to raise with you the question of whether marketing is only ever a problem. I mean, that's certainly the way that we see it because we think about alcohol marketing. But I think, and again, as Amy said, there are opportunities for marketing to be used to promote public health goals and, and behaviour change that's obviously required in order to achieve those. So what I'd like to do is to end by leaving you with some questions about how we might be able to explore that potential more effectively than I think we're doing at the moment. So first of all, then, I want to look at corporate social responsibility and what it actually means. Now, I want you to think about what, what comes to mind when you think about corporate social responsibility. What's a campaign, an event, activity, facility? Anything? No? <laughs> Look, it's not that hard. You will have all heard of at least two of these, and most of you should also have heard of Cheers as well. These are great examples of corporate social responsibility. The plannings of events, the provision of facilities that obviously do bring benefit and enjoyment to families. The reason I want to draw your attention to them, though, is that they do much more than just provide those consumer benefits. They will always be providing a corporate benefit as well. So in the case of Coca-Cola, I mean, marketing Nirvana, if you are marketing to children, is getting Father Christmas to endorse your brand. And so sponsoring Christmas in the park and developing that association with Father Christmas is one of the most potent things that Coca-Cola can do in targeting their brand to children. Ronald McDonald House Charities obviously provides important support to families at times of crisis for them. But what it also does is to open up the potential for negotiations with medical facilities to open outlets. It's the development of a relationship that enables corporate benefit to follow. And the Cheers organisation, which I had not heard of, is an industry-based website. And if you have a look at that closely, the key line is, is individual responsibility. 
It is not recognition of the fact that the environment or their activities within that environment might be promoting problematic behaviours. It is sheeting home the responsibility for those behaviours to individuals who are exerting insufficient control over themselves. And the last one that I want to leave you with, which I think is really just the most egregious example of corporate cynicism, is this one. Who sponsors Keep New Zealand Beautiful? Yep. It is their archetypal polluter of people and their environments. British American Tobacco is a sponsor of Keep New Zealand Beautiful. And so I think these examples then show us how important corporate relationships are. Now, because um, CSR is becoming so widespread, obviously it's, it's also attracting attention uh, from academics. And Donna Duane is an academic who's written quite extensively on this. And I just want to give you a couple of quotes because I think what they do uh, are highlight the problems that CSR presents to people working in public health. So as Duane says, it enables businesses to claim progress despite the lack of evidence that any verifiable change is actually taking place. So we are doing something good, even though we continue to be doing all these other sorts of activities that we know promote harm. What Corporate Watch and NGO said, CSR will continue to be little more than PR for as long as it's easier and cheaper to spin than it is to change. And I think that's a really important quote because what it does is highlight the need for environmental change. Until organisations find that it is more expensive to spin than it is to change, there is no incentive for them to do anything differently. And finally, and I think this is a really important quote, Miller says, like the tip of the iceberg, most CSR activity is invisible. It's off our normal spectrum. We don't know it's happening and it's very difficult to find out about it. And what he also goes on to say is CSR is more than just image management or image repair. It's actually an attempt to increase corporate domination. So in other words, it's an active power gaining activity. It's it's an orchestrated campaign by organisations to shape the environment in which they do business and to make that environment easier uh, and safer for, for them to operate within. So, as I said at the outset, I think we have a lot to learn from tobacco, and I just want to share with you a, an advertisement that several tobacco companies used in the United States in the mid-1950s when the evidence about cigarette smoking and, and cancer was becoming increasingly documented in the medical literature. Now, the first thing I'd like you to notice about this is that it, it is, of course, not branded by any tobacco company. It's put out by this incredibly scientific and independent-sounding organisation the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. So let's see just what the Tobacco Industry Research Committee have to say. They say, we accept an interest in people's health. It's a basic responsibility, and it's more than that. It's, a paramount, it's paramount to every other consideration in our business. It's our top priority. And they go on to say, we believe the products we make are not injurious to health. We always have and always will cooperate closely with those whose task it is to safeguard the public health. Well, that must be why they are threatening the New Zealand government with litigation if it proceeds with its eminently sensible and evidence-based plan to introduce plain packaging. Let's keep looking at tobacco. These, this image is, is often known as the Seven Dwarves. It's Seven Tobacco Company. I'm not sure they're all that short, though. Seven Tobacco Company executives in a congressional hearing testifying under oath, under oath, that nicotine is not addictive. Okay, so let's, we have in tobacco an amazing resource because about 70 million uh, formerly secret industry documents are now available in a repository that researchers can peruse and this is one of the things that was uncovered. It's a document that says from an industry scientist, moreover nicotine is addictive. We are then in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug effective in the release of stress mechanisms. Now I want you to look at the date that, that, doc that was on that document. It's 1963. Now let's go back 
to the Seven Dwarves and have a look at when that image was printed in the New York Times, it was 1994. It was three decades later. Now, we know that the tobacco industry is like the nadir of deceit and duplicity for industry behaviour, and I wouldn't argue that every corporation would sink to these depths, but I think what it does do is highlight the fundamental divide between public health and corporate activity. Corporate activity, as Milton Friedman said, has one social responsibility, and that's to deliver a profit to shareholders. And that's a very different responsibility to the one that people in public health face. And I think it's one that you always need to bear in mind. It doesn't mean to say that corporate activity will never overlap with public health, but there will always be a point at which the interests start to divide. So some key lessons that I think we can learn from the tobacco industry, they really frame the debate and they still do. They focus on doubt, uncertainty, ambiguity. Again, if we look at an industry document, 1968, it says the most important type of story is one that casts doubt here on the cause and effect of disease and smoking. Eye-grabbing headlines are needed and they should call out controversy, contradiction, other factors, unknowns. I mean, all of this must sound alarmingly familiar to you. I mean, I see it all the time when tobacco point of sale displays were removed, exactly the headlines that were run. When we're talking about plain packaging, the very same arguments that are coming forward. And you must also recognise these in the debate over alcohol measures. So history, I think, does repeat, and we can certainly learn from it. And I think we learn from it most by trying to look at what is going on beyond, underneath the iceberg that Miller talked about. And I just want to give you one example of that which um, came to my attention from that highly reliable publication critic, the Otago University Student Association newspaper. And it's a quote from Michael Woodhouse, who's a Dunedin List MP, and he was being interviewed, asked a series of questions, one of which was why he had voted to keep the drinking age at 18. And he said, we were getting lobbied like crazy. And you know, lobbying works if it's done well. And in the end, it was really, where is the problem? And the simple answer that he was given was no, don't support it. Well, I walk past Michael Woodhouse's office in Dunedin every morning on my way to work, and I can tell him the problem is all over the footpath <laughs> leading from his office into the octagon. So I don't know if he walks or drives to work or if it's been hosed off by the time he puts his feet down, but the problem is pretty clear. But what I think this quote shows is just how powerful lobbying can be. It describes the problem publicly as incredibly complex, very difficult, not amenable to easy solutions, but privately, that is exactly what politicians are being fed. Busy people looking for simple answers are being given those answers. And that, I think, is what all of us working in public health need to think about more carefully. Lobbying, I think, can sometimes be even more insidious, and a current example that I find particularly concerning are comments that Catherine Rich has made. She is the chief executive of the Food and Grocery uh, Manufacturers Council, and this is what she uh, allegedly said about plain packaging reported in the NBR. And she said, I sometimes wonder if any of this, the alleged trade implications and consequences, occurs to public health activists. Now, you know, I don't think she's using that as a term of affection or respect. <laughs> Public health activists who are blindly calling, so they're not looking at the very well-established and carefully tested evidence base. They're just honing out on a whim there as if it's some sort of magic wand that will solve all our ills. An overly simplistic look. A, a panacea that's being offered without further thought. What's really concerning about this is the contrast between her statements and those of the Health Promotion Agency on whose board she sits. As experts, so they're not activists, they're actually experts in marketing and behaviour change, and their focus is not on trade implications, actually it's on public health. It's on reducing the uptake of smoking among young people, and on that basis, using their expertise, they believe the introduction of plain packaging for tobacco products is a significant step that will reduce the industry's ability to market to and recruit new smokers 
particularly youth. I mean, that to me is a striking conflict of interest that highlights exactly how difficult it is to counter the sort of lobbying that we can observe but sometimes uh, find difficult to challenge. So just to, to end with a, a quick comment here in this section on the tobacco industry, I mean, I'm sure Jenny, Doug, Sally, any of the people working in this room, if, if you got a dollar for every time you had been called a wowser, a killjoy, the alcohol police, I mean, you know, you would be hosting your own private university. And I think, you know, we need to remember that big tobacco, like all of these major corporations that are very threatened by public health, they love to depict us as goody two-shoes, killjoys. And that's a desperate ploy that I think we need to take face on um, because all it's doing is distracting attention away from the harm that their products cause. So I think we really need to call out the industry. And I, and I think increasingly this is happening. These are a couple of quotes from a judgment from some US tobacco litigation. And and it said, all too often when our choice is between health and business, what businesses do is choose concealment over disclosure, sales over safety, and money over morality. Who are these persons who knowingly and secretly put the buying public at risk solely for the purpose of making profits and believe that the illness and death of consumers is just an apparent cost to their own prosperity? So despite some rising pretenders, and you may well think that the alcohol industry is challenging the tobacco industry uh, for head of the, the race at the moment, the tobacco industry may be the king of concealment and disinformation. So I think it is really important to call out the industry where we have the evidence that contrasts their public knowledge, uh, their private knowledge with their public behaviour. I want to move quickly on to marketing now. Um, as I said at the outset, marketing is only common sense, but it wouldn't be marketing if it wasn't dressed up as something much prettier than merely common sense. Um, and I guess when, when I talk to colleagues and say, look, there isn't actually a heck of a lot to know about marketing and say it is just common sense, they say, well, sometimes common sense is actually not that easy to recognise. And so forgive me if I'm just telling you common sense that you already know um, very well. I think there are just three principles to marketing, and they are that you have to be visible, you have to be accessible, and you have to be affordable. Or in other words, you have to be pretty much like this photo here. Being visible in marketing is often um, revolves around creating brand personalities, and I've got four brand personalities here, uh, and I want you to tell me which brands they represent. And here's a clue, they are all beer brands. So which beer brand is the renegade joker? Tui, absolutely. Which brand represents male strength? Spates, yep, yep, Spates. Which brand represents fun times? Always head with other people, export gold, and our national icon. Okay, so you can see just how cleverly brand personalities have been created around each of those beers. The reason why brands are really important is because you know, when you start to create personalities around them, you can develop the sort of ubiquity that I talked about earlier. When brands become integrated with our everyday activities, they really are extremely powerful, and that's what brand managers are trying to do. Make brands not only a normal part of our lives, but a required part of our lives. So if we have a look at this Karuba example here, I mean, this is a promotion taken from a couple of years ago, it's an astonishing promotion. The prize is 20 take-home party sponsorships worth $10,000. So the winners are not just individuals, they have a much higher status than that. They are Karuba ambassadors. They are famous for making the party happen. Now, it might seem as though I'm, I'm just poking fun at this and overemphasizing it, but you know, it actually really works. And this is a great quote um, taken from some work that Tim McCrina, a uh, part of the Shaw Fariki Centre that, that Sally Caswell runs, um, put in a paper, and the, he was talking to young people about alcohol brands, and one young, young man said, now with that export ad, they got that bus, hey, I'd love to do that, you, like, you grab a whole lot of people and you just go, mm, but you'd need export 
to do it as well. And that, I think, is an amazing example of how the brand has been so closely and cleverly integrated with this young person's idea of having fun. Being accessible usually means maximising distribution. It's exactly why Jenny said removing alcohol from sales in supermarkets is so important. Now, nearly 100 years ago, somebody had a vision that his brand would always be within arm's reach of desire. Was it any of those brands? It was Coca-Cola. And you can see how well that strategy worked for that brand and how well it's now working for alcohol brands. Being accessible means owning prime locations within stores, so there are entry points, areas of very high visibility, areas where people have to slow down, where there are opportunities for sampling and additional merchandising or, or giveaways. The strategy really is the longer people spend in a space, the higher the probability that they'll make purchases from the products that are around them. Value-added promotions like price discounts we know appeal very strongly to young people. They absolutely love getting a whole lot of free stuff and that's exactly what this Karuba promotion is offering them. So competitions, getting free Wi-Fi brought to you by an RTD, all of those things um, have a very strong appeal to young people. And the outcome, as, as I said in my, my title, is that you know, when I started looking at it, responsible alcohol marketing, because all of these promotions are happening under our current self-regulatory system, responsible alcohol marketing really does seem like something of a public health oxymoron if these are the promotions that are currently happening and able to be permitted. But I just wanted to finish, not on that somewhat chastening and gloomy note, but by suggesting to you that marketing might have some power, some potential to bring about change. Now, I want to start by saying I think there's absolutely no doubt that change only occurs in response to environmental change. So I would never advocate running social marketing campaigns uh, in lieu of, of putting in place sensible, straightforward regulations, exactly the sort that's been proposed in the five plus. Um, and four of those five plus suggestions uh, address marketing, address the three principles that I was just outlining earlier. But I think once we have a supportive environment, then social marketing does have a role to play. And here again, I think we've got a lot that we can learn from tobacco. I think there's just one lesson, and that's the only lesson that we have to remember when we're thinking about social marketing in a supportive, regulated environment. Now, I want to show you a couple of examples of uh, youth smoking prevention campaigns. And what do you think of those? How effective do you think these would be likely to be? You say, think, don't smoke, and the other one says, don't wipe out, think, don't smoke. Actually, they are completely useless campaigns. I mean, they are, and the reason why they are so utterly useless is not simply because the one on the right is, is just redolent with tobacco imagery. I mean, the snowboard looks like a matchstick, and if they aren't clouds of tobacco smoke in the background, well, I don't really know what they are. And these are hopeless because they are appealing to people's head and not to their heart. So it will be no surprise to you, I hope, to learn that these were part of Philip Morris's, a large the owner of the Marlborough brand youth smoking prevention campaign. And I mean, this one I think just, I mean, I had to show you this one. Tobacco is wacko if you're a teen. But if you're a teen and you don't want to be a teen or you want to show the whole world that you're not a teen, then tobacco is the product that is going to help you to do that. So it's no surprise that when these um, advertisements were evaluated, um, they were found to increase the likelihood that young people would be susceptible to smoking experimentation. So they had the exactly the reverse effect. What we need to do, the only lesson I think we need to remember, is we don't try and talk to the head, we talk to the heart. This man is Brian Lee Curtis, he's 32 years old and he's, he's got his oldest son who's about five in that photo on his knee. This is Brian Lee Curtis just a couple of hours before he died. Nine weeks later, he had small cell carcinoma of the lung and that's his wife Bobby and their younger son. Now, we don't have to think, smoking's not a very good idea when we look at that. That's, 
That's an image now shown on Australian tobacco packages that I think speaks entirely to the heart. It, it elicits a strong emotional response and I think the evidence in the tobacco literature is that's what we need to do if we want to bring about behaviour change. So what are we doing in relation to alcohol? This is part of a campaign that was run and the question down the bottom says, was last night really worth it? Okay, and so we've got a picture of somebody sitting in a wine glass and the implication is pretty clear that she's had a fairly rugged night and is now suffering the consequences of that. I think this image, this advertisement, tries to talk to our heads yet again. I mean, and that's why I think it's not going to be very effective because these are the situations where people are making those decisions. And it's the same with this. It's another rational conversation. It's assuming that our decisions are cognitively driven, whereas they're environmentally driven and influenced by emotion and how we're feeling at the time. So that's why in a situation like that, we're not likely to remember those conversations. I just wanted to share a quote that, which I think really epitomises this sort of temporal gap between a lot of the messages that we're giving people and the changes that we're trying to bring about. So this is a, a young adult male smoker and we're talking about warning labels and about health, health warnings in particular which make very rational appeals. And he said, you know, the thing is, having one smoke isn't, a little bit of trepidation here, might not, nah, it isn't going to kill you in the short term. So people are going to be, oh, smoking, you know, I'm going to smoke the smoke, but I'm not going to drop dead after it. That is the time gap <laughs> that we have to convince people that smoking is bad for them if we want to use a rational appeal like health messages. That's the kind of temporal distance that young people in, in particular operate on. So what can we do instead? Well, I think we need to think much more about people's emotional responses and think about the simple things, like what really matters to people. Now, looking good is something that matters to people, and that's why I think these campaigns, which are, you know, like the one on the right is a really chilling campaign, much more likely to resonate with young people than some sort of rational discourse that in, uh, tries to engage them cognitively. Being in control of the big things, she didn't want to do it, but she couldn't say no. So just some final thoughts then. Um, I think regulation is really pivotal to changes in drinking behaviour. I think education is, is a weak and long-term measure. It is never going to work very effectively and bringing about behaviour change in an environment that's just redolent with commercial cues and imagery. And even social marketing, I don't think, can counter those commercial influences very successfully if it's not within a, a supportive environment. However, I think marketing can play a positive role in, in changing behaviour once we have that regulation in place. But if it's going to do that, then I think we really have to rethink our approach because if we don't, then I'm not even sure that we are challenging the tip of the iceberg. I think we're just left in a situation like this. Thank you very much. Um, Janet, how would you compare the attitude of tobacco companies and alcohol companies with the automotive industry, particularly companies like Volvo and the products that they develop? Well, I don't really know very much about the automotive industry. I mean, I know, I know that Volvo has developed a position where they, they manufacture cars to a high safety specification, but they do that because they see a competitive advantage in doing it. So, I mean, I would never argue that corporations cannot bring about public benefit, but they do it because it's in their interest. I'd well, argue safety is in the interest of the alcohol industry as well. Yeah, well, that's, yes, that's true. Uh, Anthony, you're up from an organisation called the Amongst Our Plus You Can Trust. It looks like in tobacco we have quite a lot of research to back uh, uh, what evidence that we're going to take it to the audience and also the when you look at the, uh, alcohol, it seems to be uh, we have quite a lack of uh, evidence base. So what can we do in that level? Well, I, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, I think people like Jenny and Doug and Sally are prolific researchers. Um, I'm not as familiar with the alcohol evidence base, but my understanding is that, that the measure 
measures that will be successful that you're advocating are all evidence-based measures. In fact, the chart that Jenny showed with the pluses indicating the likely effect and the public support is an evidence-based chart. So I, I think the evidence is, is as strong for alcohol as it, it would be for tobacco. I think the difference between alcohol and tobacco is that tobacco has tariatoria. I think that's the difference. It's not the evidence, it's the political champion. Janet, Gordon Rosewood, against Alcohol Action South Canterbury. I was just interested, listening to your presentation, it sort of forms the basis of a paper called The Ethics of Marketing. Is there such a paper, and if not, why not? Oh, there are, there are lots of papers. Um, I mean, you know, again, I don't want to feel defensive about my, well, not overly defensive about my discipline, but I, mean, I teach papers called Societal Issues in Marketing. They're taught at every university in New Zealand. Um, they get quite large um, student classes, so they're, they're reasonably popular papers. Um, so I think, I think marketers do do a lot of work to recognise the social implications of some of the decisions that companies like this make. Um, but, you know, just, we, we can't guarantee that our students are going to go out made in our image, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Stephen, a medical student from Christchurch. Um, just wondering, when you talk about marketing, or particularly any advertising, do you see they seem to be targeted towards sort of an instant gratification, or, you know, uh, a company might be looking to, you know, make money in the short term. What, what are the challenges you face with marketing when you're looking at long-term benefits over short-term gains? I mean, it seems to be much more challenging to be telling someone to, you know, think in five, ten years down the track rather than, you know, go out and, and have a beer or whatever and, and feel good with them the next sort of few hours or that night. You're right, it, it is, and I mean it's a huge problem in tobacco when you're trying to say to young people, you know, don't smoke now and you won't die a horrible death of lung cancer in 40 years time. I mean it just absolutely makes no sense to them. And that's why I think we need to think much more cleverly about what matters to people. And so looking good, being in control, those sorts of things I think have a far stronger immediacy to young people. And there are the kinds of messages, I mean with the, the young people in tobacco, we know that smelling is a really big problem. You talk to young guys, they go out on Saturday night, all they're looking for is someone who's going to go home and, and spend the night with them. Now if they stink, their chances of hooking up with someone are much less. And that's a really powerful message to use with them. Um, so I think you know, we, we do need to stop thinking about things from a medical perspective and start thinking about you know, what is it that, that young people or the audiences we're communicating with, what is it that they're getting out of this behaviour and how can we challenge and undermine and replace that? Um, Jennifer, how influential is the role of mainstream media, media releases, stories of drug and disorder and those sorts of things and changing people's behaviour or public attitudes? Um, I, I don't know is, is the short answer. I, I don't know of any study that's ever been undertaken looking at, at those sorts of, of things. I mean, I think alcohol, um, it faces a slightly different problem to, to tobacco. I mean, I think tobacco has a huge problem where um, most of my friends don't smoke, um, you know, my kids don't smoke. Um, most of my students don't smoke and so it's very easy for people like me to think actually we, we've dealt with smoking and I think that's part of the problem with alcohol even if we see things reported in the paper um, unless we're encountering the problems of alcohol on a day-to-day -day basis then it's easy to think that it's somebody else's problem and that's why I think probably the first strategy is not in trying to increase public awareness or public knowledge, it's in changing the environment. And that's what's worked for tobacco. It's regulation rather than awareness. Um, it's great to have public support, but you already have that, or, or at least according to the HPA survey that Jenny put up. And so I'm not sure you need to get high levels of, of public support. You need a politician who's willing to lead the campaign for you, and once you bring in regulation and change, then people will become more aware of the problems that alcohol creates. <coughs> so I think you need to look at the process maybe from, from the top first and then down to public awareness. It's certainly what worked for tobacco, I think. Does the, does the industry have the same uh, representation in Parliament um, 
uh, with, with pressure groups. Uh, I mean, sorry, does the, the counter agents, I mean, do they, do they, do, does the health agency have, have the, the, the people constantly in parliament as the, as the alcohol industry is said to have four or five constantly there? Well, I don't know, and I think that sort of information is actually very difficult to obtain, and that's why the, the Greens' um, bill to uh, force higher levels of disclosure of lobbying, I think, is, a, is going to be a really important piece of legislation if it gets passed. I, I simply can't answer your question. I, I don't know if, if you... Oh, my I, answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the answer is no, and you can certainly see that with something like the um, TPP, the right. Specific mm -hmm. Partnership Agreement, which you know, yeah. um, tobacco advertising is a perfect example of it, and in the health sector, um, I know all the health practitioners, the whole health sector have made numerous um, representations to health select committee to be able to present, to have public submission, they will not discuss it, and that's... Mm. Um, that's a good example. Mm. Are there any questions up there? Yeah. Uh, Alistair Lane, Presbyterian Church. Um, Janet, I'd be interested in your comments on the industry argument that they're interested uh, not in expanding alcohol consumption but looking to gain market share. Yeah, well, that's an argument that, that's always rehearsed in tobacco as well. I mean, industries are interested in maximising profit. You know, that's, in some countries, that's what they're legally required to do. They're, they're beholden to their shareholders to deliver the best returns that they can. And so that, that means that if they can grow the market, then why would they not want to do that? And it, it just seems to me that that's a disingenuous argument. You always get more return if you increase primary demand than if you focus on, on trying to shift secondary demand. Uh, Ruth Richards, I work in um, public health in Wellington. Um, just looking at the difference, one of the differences between tobacco and alcohol is that when you're smoking a cigarette, you're usually making a conscious choice to do so. But when you're drinking No, alcohol, I don't think you are. No, sorry, no, just let me finish what I want to say. That when you're drinking alcohol, alcohol is a mind-altering substance that you then become incapable of making any rational decision whatsoever. I don't think tobacco has the same effect on the brain as alcohol, where you remove that element of choice. I think Is there are some opportunities to look at what we can do in that space? Well, I, I think I disagree with you. I think nicotine is an incredibly addictive substance. I mean, a drug would be the best person um, to talk to that. There, there's been some work done in the US using the sort of fRMI images that Jenny showed of, of young adults' brains, showing the, the difference between smokers' and non-smokers' brains. I don't, I mean, most smokers, we know 85% of smokers, if they could live their lives again, they wouldn't be smokers. I've never met a smoker who wants their child to smoke. Um, so most smokers desperately don't want to be smokers. Um, so I don't think they're making a choice. They're just driven by this underlying physiological need. Um, so to that extent, I think there are some very strong parallels between um, alcohol and tobacco. But we heard from Jamie that many heavy drinkers are not addicted. So well, it's the, um, the, they're not addicted to the substance, but I think that they've got into a behavioural pattern that is very, very difficult for them to change. Now, you can call that a habit or you can call it an addiction, and I think, I think that that's just sort of playing with semantics, really. But we know that with smoking, that there are two very difficult behaviours people have to give up. One is the physical behaviour of holding cigarettes, the other is their addiction to nicotine. So I, I, I mean, I'm not an addiction expert, but just looking in from the outside, I would certainly see some stronger parallels between the two behaviours there. Two more questions, one up there. Janet, my name is Jeremy McMinn, I'm an addiction psychiatrist in Wellington. Really enjoy the sense that you're talking to us today, um, but the adverts that you've put up, the, the alcohol industry's adverts, they're cool and untrue. And then the counter adverts that we might put up, they were true, but pretty uncool and negative. They were unpleasant images. Um, a lot of professionals, psychiatrists, other doctors, lawyers will do pro bono work. Could we invite you or your students to do a pro bono positive anti-alcohol campaign? Well, 
<laughs> I'm one of the world's least creative people, so you definitely wouldn't want me having input into a campaign. I mean, I, advertising agencies will do pro bono campaigns, so why not approach them? They're the experts in, in this sort of thing. Um, and I mean, I would be happy to offer whatever advice I, I could, um, but I, I really don't have expertise in alcohol marketing. But I, I do think that there is a, a parallel from tobacco that might be really useful to you, and that's the Smoking Not Our Future campaign, which the Health Promotion Agency runs, which is all about demythologising tobacco <laughs> and smoking as cool substances and the behaviour that you use to define yourself as one of the in crowd. And I think they have very successfully um, changed perceptions of smoking among young people so that it's, it's now something that the cool kids actually don't do. Um, so I think maybe there are... And in fact, you've got the Health Promotion Agency and ALAC is now part of that, which should be doing this very work. So I mean, maybe it's an opportunity to talk more with them about how they could refocus some of their work and what they've got planned. Well, one more question from the really disingenuous to say that Alco Pops were hardly advertised. I mean, Alco Pops are advertised extensively at the point of sale, which is really the only place that probably matters for young people who are not consuming the levels of mass media that they used to consume anyway. So I, I think that's, that's a statement that focuses on mass media advertising and doesn't take into account the wider promotions that were undertaken for Alco Pops. But to address the first part of your question, are there spillover effects from brand advertising? And it's because it's not the area in which I'm actively researching, I can't point you to a particular study, although um, Jenny or Doug or Sally would be better able to do that. But logically, um, what I would expect is that when you have an environment where lots of brands are advertising, then the behaviour that's being promoted becomes much more normal. And I would expect that to increase consumption simply because it makes it okay, it facilitates it. Um, so, but, but that's a kind of a logical supposition on my part, not something where I can cite an actual study to support it. But Jenny or Doug, do you, do you know of work? Sally, I think, would probably be the best there are, person. Um, there are papers. Oh, there you are. And there are papers which have been published in the marketing which we talk about spillover, particularly across family groups. So brand advertising will increase the use of other brand 